When we talk about ketones and aldehydes and alcohols in organic chemistry too, the reaction that tends to bubble up here is acetal formation. This reaction involving nucleophilic addition of the alcohol to the ketone or aldehyde, followed by the loss of water with addition of a second equivalent of alcohol. So this reactivity is based on the fundamental idea that the carbonyl carbon is electrophilic. We're very familiar with this. And the alcohol oxygen is nucleophilic and can thus add to the carbonyl carbon. Furthermore, that carbonyl oxygen can pick up protons and ultimately be eliminated as water. That's what we're seeing here highlighted in orange. So this basic reaction type of alcohols with ketones and aldehydes seems like it would be highly relevant to, carbon, uh, to uh, carbohydrates, and it absolutely is. Very, very important reaction type for the carbohydrates. Now, if we kind of hit pause before we move ahead for a second and remind ourselves what actually goes on in this mechanism, we'll recall that in the first stage of the mechanism, one equivalent of alcohol adds, and this involves the intermediacy of a structure called a hemiacetal. The hemiacetal is derived from addition of one equivalent of alcohol, the OR group and this H here, to the starting ketone or aldehyde. And this hemiacetal structure can even be important in hydroxy ketones and alcohol and aldehydes in intramolecular sense. In other words, if I've got a molecule that has a hydroxyl group and a carbonyl group in it, and cyclization would produce a ring of five or six members, it's quite common for the most stable form of the molecule to actually be the cyclic hemiacetal, which is this structure right here, derived from addition of O and H across the CO double bond to produce the hemiacetal. And so as long as that ring size is right, five or six members, this can happen spontaneously. And carbohydrates are very, very frequently poised to do this kind of cyclization very, very easily. So most sugars actually exist in their closed or cyclic hemiacetal forms. So in that big survey of aldose and keto sugars that we just did, those Fisher projections correspond to a structure that's generally a very, very small percentage of the equilibrium composition of a sugar in solution. And solid phase sugars generally exist only in their cyclic hemiacetal form. Just so to show you an example of this, let's take our line angle structure of glucose right here and let's imagine what happened if this nucleophilic hydroxyl group linked to carbon five attacked the electrophilic carbonyl carbon at carbon one and proton transfers neutralized everything out, we'd end up with a cyclic structure like this. This is known as a pyranose because of its resemblance to the six-membered oxygen-containing ring pyran, and it's a cyclic hemiacetal. Notice we have a carbon right here. This is the formal, former carbonyl carbon in the open chain form, or carbon one that's linked to an OH group and an OR group. That's a hemiacetal. And sugars are very, very commonly drawn in their cyclic hemiacetal forms. Again, because at equilibrium in solution and in the solid state, most sugars do exist. Most monosaccharides and polysaccharides for that matter, exist as cyclic hemiacetals or in the case of polysaccharides, acetals. You'll also see sugar derivatives drawn in cyclic form. Derivatives where typically this hemiacetal hydroxyl group has been replaced with something else. In the same way that a nucleophilic alcohol comes in and displaces this OH group in acetal formation, other types of nucleophiles, such as other alcohols, can come in and displace this OH group. And that leads to some very interesting and important reactivity of the carbohydrates that we'll touch on later. So we've seen here that glucose can cyclize to form a cyclic hemiacetal, and this is typically the highly favored form of the sugar to the tune of greater than 99.99% cyclic or closed form at equilibrium. And here we're going to focus on the so-called pyranose forms, which are characterized by a six-membered ring. In glucose, we get a six-membered ring via the hydroxyl group linked to C5 which is this hydroxyl group I've circled here, linking up with carbon one, which is electrophilic due to the aldehyde right there, right? C1 is a carbonyl carbon, fundamentally. And so we've got a good nucleophile, 
go to Electrophile, they can link up, and we get a six-membered ring. And it's called a pyranose because, again, of the resemblance of this six-membered ring containing oxygen to the six-membered cyclic oxygen containing compound pyran, one of whom structures looks like this. All right, so this is called a pyranose form of glucose. Let's talk about the mechanism of how exactly this comes about. Cyclization is catalyzed by acid or base, which facilitates the transfer of protons, for example, from the OH group and onto the carbonyl oxygen. And under acidic conditions, we first protonate the carbonyl oxygen. We're very familiar with this idea at this point for acid-catalyzed reactions of ketones and aldehydes. Then the hydroxyl group is perfectly poised to add to that activated carbonyl group in what we would call a nucleophilic addition step, right? This establishes the CO bond, and now the only difference between this and the final neutral pyranose is loss of a proton, and that can be done by something like water or some base in the reaction solution, in the sugar solution, and we end up at the final pyranose sugar. Now, one more important mechanistic thing to point out here is that the addition step, the step right here, established a stereocenter. That stereocenter can be formed with one of two configurations. You could imagine that if we turned over the aldehyde, right? Imagine we rotated around the C1-C2 bond to swing that carbonyl oxygen to the bottom and swing the aldehyde hydrogen up. Well, then we'd get the opposite configuration at this stereocenter. So this cyclization has the potential to form a mixture of stereoisomers. And on the next slide, we're gonna look at the differences between those two stereoisomers, which are diastereomers, since none of the other configurations change during this cyclization process. So the cyclization of sugars creates a new stereocenter, and this leads to two possible diastereomers of the cyclic hemiacetal. This is true of pyranoses and the five-membered furanoses, which we'll see in a little bit. By the way, both of these types of cyclic sugars can form alpha and beta, what are called anomers. These are called anomers because they differ in configuration at that new stereocenter at C1, which is known as the anomeric carbon. In an aldose, that's the carbonyl carbon, that's the aldehyde carbon, and in a ketose, it's actually the carbonyl carbon as well, the ketone carbonyl carbon. That's known as the anomeric carbon, and in an aldose, that's C1. In a ketose, that's typically C2. All right, so how do these different anomers come about? Well, let's imagine we rotated around the C1-C2 bond, swinging the aldehyde carbonyl group up, if you like, so the carbonyl oxygen is pointed up. This actually exposes a different face of the carbonyl group to the nucleophilic hydroxyl group. So here we have kind of the back face, if you like, exposed to that hydroxyl, but if I turn over the aldehyde, now the opposite face of the carbonyl group is pointed towards that hydroxyl group. And so we're gonna end up with a different configuration at the new stereocenter after this rotation. And this is how the two different anomers come about, depending on the rotational state or the, the position of the carbonyl group relative to that hydroxyl group. All right, and the two different anomers are known as alpha and beta. And here again, we have a case where we could certainly use RS labels to distinguish between the two different anomers of a cyclic pyranose, glucopyranose. But this convention was developed quite a long time ago and persists to this day just because it's highly useful for sugars um, to designate them as alpha or beta. So we could use RNS. Alpha and beta are effectively like RNS. They are stereochemical descriptors, but they're based on a convention that is not the same as the RS convention, essentially. So let's talk about that convention now. How do we know whether a given anomer is alpha or beta? Well, here's the basic idea. In the alpha anomer, the new OH group, the newly created OH group, which is going to be linked to the anomeric carbon, linked to carbon 1, points in the same direction in the Fischer projection as the bottommost OH group in the Fischer projection, the bottommost stereogenic carbon's OH group. The beta anomer has the opposite configuration of the alpha anomer at the anomeric carbon. And in this anomer, the newly created hydroxyl group in the Fischer projection at carbon 1 points in the opposite direction of the OH group at the bottommost carbon, the bottommost stereogenic carbon 
in the Fisher projection. So I think it helps to actually look at and think about the Fisher projections of these cyclic um, monosaccharides to really get a sense of what we mean by this. So in the alpha anomer, which is up here, let's really, really zero in on the configuration here. And imagine putting this O in the ring at the top of our head and looking this way as if we were looking at this from a Fisher projection viewpoint. We would see, and this it is very important to pause and make sure that you can see this visually on your own, we can see that this hydroxyl would be pointed to our right and this H to our left with the O at the top of our field of vision and this carbon at the bottom, which is exactly the orientation we're assuming here. So this is a Fisher projection that corresponds to this configuration. These two representations are equivalent. It's important to, to make sure you can see that visually, and if not, it may be worthwhile to pull out a model kit and build a model or look at a three-dimensional model of alpha d glucopyranose. Now, because we know this is a D-sugar, we could shortcut and say, all right, at the bottommost stereocenter, I know that that hydroxyl, which happens to be the cyclizing hydroxyl, points to the right. And, uh, or, or we could notice that, in fact, if we assumed the Fisher project projection viewpoint, that OH would be pointed to our right. There's an H down here. We'd look at it from this way. And that O at that bottommost stereocenter, carbon-5, would be pointed to the right. The newly created OH and the bottommost OH in the Fisher projection are pointing in the same direction. This is the alpha anomer. The only difference in the beta anomer is in the configuration of the anomeric carbon. And so the bottommost stereocenter looks exactly the same in the Fisher projection. The only difference is that newly created hydroxyl group now points to the left instead of to the right. And this is the beta anomer. Now, a couple of things about this. You go out there, you read about this online, you're going to pick up all kinds of nonsense and people on YouTube who are going to try to sell you this one simple trick to draw alpha and beta anomers. And it's not all nonsense, but it's mostly nonsense. Um, this is the convention, very specifically this, the bottom stereogenic carbon is the reference carbon for alpha and beta. Even if it's not the cyclizing stereocenter, even if it's not the stereocenter at which cyclization occurs. So for example, if we were making a five-membered ring with the hydroxyl group above, this would still be an alpha, and, and say that hydroxyl group was on the other side, and so the Fisher projection looked like this, that would still be an alpha anomer because the bottommost hydroxyl group, which would be a free OH in that sugar, is still pointing in the same direction as the newly created OH group. It's the bottommost stereocenter that sets that configuration, and it's all uh, sets that configurational label, and it's all relative to the Fisher projection. This is the basis of this convention, and probably what I'll end up doing is in the video description for this video, I will include a link to the IUPAC standard for this that essentially lays it, lays it down. It is an arbitrary convention at the end of the day, but this is how it's defined. The one thing you can do uh, with glucose that uh, you may hear that's not total nonsense is to look at the stereochemical relationship between the CH2OH group and the newly created OH group to get a sense of alpha and beta. When the CH2OH group is trans to the newly created OH group, that's an alpha anomer, at least for D-glucose. When the CH2OH group is cis to the newly created stereocenter, that is the beta anomer, that's beta D-glucose. And so this is a bit of a shortcut when you're dealing with D-glucose for drawing the alpha and beta anomers. And it's one of those, if you want to just remember one thing, one quick trick related to anomers, this will at least allow you to draw the anomers of D-glucose quite quickly. D-glucopyranose, I should say, very quickly. Now, these anomers are diastereomers, right? They differ in configuration actually only at one carbon. They only differ in configuration right here. So they have different chemical properties and will exist in different amounts 
at equilibrium in, say, a solution of glucose. And as it turns out, an equilibrium mixture of glucose in solution is about 34% alpha anomer and, and about 66% beta anomer. You get slightly different numbers depending on which sources you, you look at here, but basically two-thirds beta anomer is a good benchmark to keep in mind. This is the major anomer for reasons that will become very clear when we look at three-dimensional structures, particularly the chair structures of alpha and beta D-glucopyranose.